Hi, thank you for joining us. My name is Ann Feldkamp and I'm with InfoBase and I'm so excited to introduce you all to Ivy Mirpol today. Hi, Ivy. Hi, Ann. Hi, everybody. Ivy has been incredibly patient with me when we got through a couple of Zoom hiccups. <laughs> thank you all. Sorry, so we were a few minutes late. <laughs> um, Ivy Mirpol is the director and producer of the film Bully, Coward, Victim, the story of Roy Cohn. This is a new film. Um, it premiered on HBO June of this year. So it was just released a few months ago. And it is an incredible story that not only touches on so much of history, but also Ivy's personal history. Um, not only is Ivy the director and producer of this film, she's also the granddaughter to Julius and Ethel Rosenberg who play an important role in this film and in history. Um, Ivy, could you tell us a little bit about um, how this film, kind of the idea for it came about? Sure, I um, just as some background, um, as Anne mentioned, as you mentioned, Anne, I am a, a, the eldest grandchild of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, um, who, um, were executed in 1953 for conspiracy to commit espionage. It was, um, and my first film called Air to an Execution is a film, uh, it got me into documentary filmmaking. And I did not think that I would be revisiting my family's story again, because it was quite um, challenging to say the least um, and cathartic in the truest sense of the word where I made that film and didn't think I really would need to tell that story again. And, but years, went by and the uh, subject of Roy Cohn kept kind of popping up and I kept thinking, well, why hasn't anyone made a film about this guy? He's a fascinating figure in American history. Um, there's so much to talk about around him, but it didn't seem like anyone was doing it. And I thought, well, if I do it, I'm going to have to then venture into my family story again, because he was the assistant prosecutor in my grandparents' case. And really the architect in many ways for the reason why my grandmother specifically ended up um, going to her death. So I, I knew that if I was going to tackle Roy Cohn, me as a filmmaker and my personal connections, that that would mean you know revisiting and trying to find a new way to tell, talk about my grandparents also. Um, but it really kept kept plaguing me, you know, I mean, this is what happens with with some of these subjects, you know, you can't shake them and you think, well, this is fascinating and there's something and 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 why not embrace the personal um, connection, because that's what the tug is, you know, I'm, I know a lot about him and a lot of people don't and I felt that way about my grandparents too, you know, for years I thought, you know, one line in my um, history book in high school, which called them the Adam spies and just kind of left it at that wasn't enough for me as a family member. And so in a way, you know, Cone, though he's not a family member, he f factored so strongly into my own personal history that I felt that he, there was more to talk about with him. So um, then to be perfectly honest, I, once Donald Trump was elected, I thought, well, I, you know, he had real connections to Donald Trump. I didn't know the extent of it till I made the film, but I thought, well, now people really need to know this history. And I think that's one of the big driving forces for me in general, when, when I approach a subject, it's a, it's a feeling like I know an, a little bit about something that I feel everybody needs to know more about. And, and I'm curious enough to pursue the more answers and fill out those stories for an audience. That's so interesting. You've said, I think so many things I felt watching the film, you know, when we first spoke, I shared with you too, you know, when you say, okay, the Rosenbergs, McCarthyism era, you know, I, it was a line in my history book. Did I know what I know today after watching your film and then the subsequent films I watched after it and all the Google searches I've done because I just became so massively intrigued by the story that really, you know, you, you said it too, um, the face of the victims, right? It yeah. was just a part of history where after getting to know you and then, you know, the film, especially, I think viewers will see how this really was um, a, a case that seemed kind of blown out of proportion and, and all of these stories really 
you know, it, it's a part of a part of our kind of really recent history. And I don't think it's a story many people know about, um, especially from the perspective that you share, um, you know, even having your father in the film, you know, their son and what it was like for him. And I mean, mm -hmm. the the part where we get into the Roy Cohn. So you you had, um, maybe we should back up for a moment. Sure. You created a film, Heir to an Execution, yes. um, that kind of, you mentioned earlier, that kind of started you learning more about Roy Cohn that I think projected you into making this film. Um, was that your first documentary? Your yes, Heir to an Execution was my first documentary. I, um, I'd worked in politics for years on Capitol Hill in Washington, DC. I'd um, worked for a congressman. I'd done numerous things before that. I had tried to be a journalist. I'd written some screenplays, but I, I, like I was alluding to before, the, the story was really pressing upon me. And I found myself like wanting to deal with it, the story of my grandparents and our family history. And it became an issue that the, the story dictated the medium. I decided that I really wanted those first person story. I wanted to find people who knew them for myself, but also I felt like that would be a real, um, you know, important um, contribution to the history that hadn't been told and to humanize them. Because I think what happens often in, in history and, you know, the professors watching this possibly will, will understand that, that sometimes, you know, we're, you know, there's so much information and then it's just a line, like we said, in a, in a, in a book or, but to really um, try to understand who people, who, who they were and put them in the context of their times to try to understand um, why they were involved, you know, to a certain extent in, you know, espionage activities, but also why they wound up where they did because of the, the, the McCarthyism, Red Scare and the, the times that they were living in. So all of that is so important for understanding it. And, and for, so it, it almost, it's interesting how it dovetails. It's like, I believe that people, you know, should we, that we should humanize people in history, but also for myself, I needed to humanize them. So yes, that was my first film. It, it I became completely enamored with documentary filmmaking after that. And then, and folk put all my focus in that because it combines so many of my interests. Um, and allowed me, you know, any subject that I become interested in, I can really delve into. So after Air and Execution, I, I made a documentary series called The Hill, which will be available on InfoBase <laughs> again too, um, based on my experiences working on Capitol Hill. Cause again, I felt like people had, a lot of people don't know what goes on behind, you know, the doors and, you know, the Rayburn office building and in the House of Representatives and it's all these passionate young people working in politics. And so I wanted to make something really fun, but educational be, um, and help people understand what hap actually goes on and, and inspire young people to get into that kind of work um, to see it as exciting. And so I, that was a six part documentary series for the Sundance Channel. I went on to do other, I worked on other shows. I did a show um, called Death Row Stories. I've done uh, shows for um, National Geographic, The Years of Living Dangerously, about climate change. I made another feature film called Indian Point that went inside the, the famed nuclear power plant outside of New York City. Um, that was shot and I made that film during the, the age of Fukushima basically to, to discuss the dangers of nuclear, potential dangers of nuclear power. But again, wanting to do a balanced approach. That's another thing that I feel very strongly about is not, you know, um, is, is including many voices in these stories. Um, and then, yeah, and then the Cone film, you know, came actually, I started working on just a couple of years ago and we moved very quickly with that one with the great support of HBO. Um, so. Well, and something you said to me that I think really will resonate with our viewers and why it's so important um, to have this type of content in education is that you're not um, an activism filmmaker. You know, you yeah. want to tell a story and have that be an authentic story. You know, the, you know, talking about the film of Roy Cohn, you know, you've mentioned to me just how important it was to fact check every single line, every piece of data yeah. and, you know, having it free be from primary sources. It's, you know, yes. It, it, it's a really, you let the story tell itself. I don't, you know, I love that you're not giving an angle to it. You're really right. just exposing um, the historic, what the historical events and letting people that knew 
those people, whether it was not as Roy Cohn, your grandparents, mm -hmm. people involved in the trial and just the, you know, the life of Roy Cohn, you have them telling the story. Yes. Um, so it's such an authentic look. And, um, you know, Roy Cohn is quite an interesting human being. Um, yeah. For those who for those of for, for people that are watching this that might be just plugging in and you know sometimes hearing that name um can you tell our viewers a little bit about who Roy Cohn was sure well so I met as I mentioned earlier he was an assistant prosecutor in my grandparents case um that was his first job out of law school basically I mean well he had he had some minor minor work but it was his first big role as an attorney um uh, and that really launched him. So then he went on to um, become the chief counsel to Senator Joe McCarthy, as many, many people will remember. And, and I hope younger people will also learn this history, be how important it is to know about um, what happened with McCarthy. So he was, he was Joe McCarthy's right-hand man and Joe McCarthy is where we got the term McCarthyism. Um, and that was a period of time when it was very dangerous to be a progressive, radical socialist, or certainly a card carrying member of the Communist Party um, during this time. Uh, we, they were being persecuted, and anyone who had, you know, even union organizers, anyone who was considered left wing um, was potentially, you know, could have their um, job. You know, lives destroyed. Um, certainly, if you're living in Washington D.C. and worked in the government, that's how it started. So, anyway, that I'm veering off, but that's so that we we deal with that. There's a lot to talk about. So, what what's fascinating about Roy Cohn? So he's an attorney. He, um, you'll see in the film what happened to Joe McCarthy. What happened to Cohn? Um, Cohn's life in Washington didn't turn out as he had hoped at that point. But he re returned to New York started a law practice, became kind of a notorious, you know, fixer. And um, I mean, he was the lawyer, a lawyer for all the major mob bosses during that period for George Steinbrenner, who owned the New York Yankees. Um, I mean, you name it, you know, he had Rupert Murdoch, he uh, and Donald Trump. Uh, he became the Trump family attorney and became very close with Donald Trump. And really um, one of the most surprising things that we learned um, in making this film, I knew about their connection. I did not know the extent of it. I did not know that what, what we really found and I believe kind of broke some news here by putting a lot together is that Cohn really helped create the Donald Trump that we know today in the sense that he put the bee in his bonnet that he could be a big shot um, on the Washington stage. He connected him with the Reagan White House introduced him to everybody in that world, including all, a lot of the people who helped Donald Trump become president, like Paul Manafort, um, Robert, Roger Stone, excuse me. And those that cast of characters were all cone confidants and allies as well. So the other part of the story though, is that Roy Cohn was a closeted gay man. And he also um, actively, you know, worked against gay civil rights bill in New York City. He was notoriously homophobic and anti-gay. And um, I wanted to explore this kind of uh, this dual life that he was living and try to understand him and understand, you know, what, you know, that how, how you know, living that kind of lie can can really, you know, turn you into something monstrous potentially. Um, so I, I, you know, there is, it's a very complicated story. And then Cohn ends up dying of AIDS, denying it all the way. He said he had liver cancer. We know he had AIDS. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that I think when you when you um, talk about history and you really get down to these personal stories about major figures. And then you start to see the connections to what to what's happening today. You just can't help but see them. So, for instance, for me, Cohn, um, the fact that he got access to AZT early as a way to save his life, and he got that through the Reagan White House. Meanwhile, the Reagan White House was ignoring the fact that AIDS was, you know, you know, tearing through the country and killing people. Um, and he wasn't doing anything about it, yet his buddy Roy Cohn was getting AZT from 
the National Institutes of Health, which was experimenting with it. It's to me, it's a little reminiscent of Donald Trump getting uh, sick with COVID and getting access to those experimental drugs that nobody else has access to yet. So it's just this, whether you are a Trump supporter or not, it's just on the face of it. It's, it's just about like, what do people in power do to preserve their power, to take care of themselves at the expense of others? And, and don't, you know, I, these are just things that I, if we learn our history, maybe we won't continue to repeat it, or we won't just buy into, you know, the stories that we're told um, that keep us from, you know, being able to uh, take care of ourselves. So, well, you know, something, you know, as you're telling this, talking more about this and like the passion you have for just, you know, digging in and telling stories, you know, your, your documentary starts with you as a young girl um, mm -hmm. giving an interview yes. and um, you're interviewing your father and he's talking about his, his parents and your grandparents who you've never met. Um, and I'm thinking of you talking about this and it almost seems like it was a little meant to be that you became a filmmaker because those early, you, you know, your, your, your early video um, is just, you know, you were a strong child and, mm -hmm. and very um, inquisitive, it seems. And so kind of seeing that um, is an interesting juxtaposition for those of you that will watch this, hopefully. Um, and just as a reminder, um, for those of you that are joining in, I know sometimes with Facebook, you can pop in at different times. Um, my name's Ann Feldkamp. I'm with uh, Infobase, and I'm interviewing Ivy Mirpol, um, who is the director and producer of the film um, Bully, Coward, Victim, the story of Ray Cohn um, from HBO. And so this is available on our Films on Demand and Access Video on Demand platforms, and we're really encouraging you to check this out if you haven't already. So we're just hearing a little bit from Ivy about um, kind of the history of making the film, some of the things that, you know, as she was looking in, telling the story um, that she learned along the way um, and kind of giving you a little bit of background to the, the making of this film. So um, Ivy, I wanted to just maybe dive in a couple of things, you know, as you made this film and it has so many different aspects, um, how can you um, envision a professor or um, someone in an educational setting, how, how would you envision them using this? this oh, film? wow. I mean, I think there's so many, well, there's so many areas um, of study that this could be applicable where, um, where of course, history, American history, um, poli, poli sci. Um, I think even journalism students, I think could be quite interested in, um, you know, learning about how Cohn manipulated the media, um, how the media at the time, you know, really, you know, these are these are questions that all journalists, I think, grapple with, like, how close do you get to a subject um, before they before they start to influence you too much or um, that questions like that. I mean, there's I mean, there's a there's a crazy moment in the film with Cindy Adams. I, I, by no stretch is she a journalist, but she had a lot of power. She's the famous gossip columnist from the New York Post. Um, but she has a lot of influence and but she was she's supposed to just be reporting the gossip. Right. But she admits on camera that Cohn basically planted stories with her. Um, you know, and I kind of, you hear me off camera saying, well, how did he do it? She goes, well, he asked me. And I'm like, I was kind of shocked by that. <laughs> um, so journalism students, I think for that reason, but also to get to know some of the fabulous journalists who I, who are in the film, whose materials that I use, um, you know, the audio, the, the rare audio that I was able to, to use of Cone being interviewed, so you hear his own voice. Um, like Lois Romano, for instance, she's a, a wonderful journalist from the Washington Post who I interview about her, her interviewing Cone and getting to know Cone, but then she also happened to find the, the reporter's notebook and the tapes from her interviews with Cone and um, uh, the reporter's notebook from her interviews with Donald Trump around the same time. So she helps uh, me prove that, she helped us prove that you know, how Cohn really planted these ideas and, you know, set, set up these interviews for Trump to push Trump onto the national stage, you know, and not just being like this New York City real estate magnet. So journalism, certainly. Um, I also think LGBTQ 
um, issues is a very, I mean, I, I, we, we really, I mean, we spent a lot of time in the film ta showing, you know, Cone's other life um, and how much happier he really truly was. You can even see it in the photos. He looks like a different person um, when he's yeah. living his life in Provincetown. Um, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, we also have, I interviewed um, Tony Kushner and Nathan Lane. So, I mean, you know, if you're a theater person, you might be, have a little bit of interest in that as well, because Angels in America is this, the play that Tony Kushner wrote there, where Roy Cohn is a major character. Um, and we actually use some scenes from the last New York City production of that play um, where Nathan Lane is in the role of Roy Cohn. So I think there's a lot, a lot um, that people could use. And I just think that, again, like we're talking about these first person stories. I mean, we took great pains to only interview people aside from Tony Kushner and Nathan Lane. And we, you know, they fit with the Angels in America part, but really everyone else, including my father, um, had interactions with Cone, had experiences with Cone, or even, or knew him very well. I, I did not want to have um, as wonderful as they often are historians or commentator or people you know what we call in my business more talking heads which are you know which are very important in certain situations but for this film we felt very strongly that the people we were interviewing actually had these very personal stories um, and they were you know colorful anecdotes and it also is important for us to make this entertaining you know I want young people to engage with this history in a way that doesn't feel dry. It feels alive, you know, it feels um, visceral. I, you know, and we, and that's why even there are certain sections where I, kept, I felt that we, our approach was let's do it from Roy's POV, Roy's point of view. So is Roy miserable because we're thinking of him as this like horrible character? No, at the, the section, for instance, where we're talking about his, all the time, time he spent at Studio 54. He was the attorney for the owners of Studio 54. That's a fun time for him and for people who were engaged in that, in that I lived during that, that life. And we wanted to do that, you know, so history, it doesn't have like to, to bring it to life that way was really important. And, and you did, there were so many sections where, you know, when you, I thought this film, I, I, can, I can say very clearly, I thought this film was gonna be about one thing. And I was continually surprised when it would take these paths and just present history in such a different way. Like you mentioned, I mean, there, this really goes from, you know, McCarthyism, McCarthyism to, you know, the, the 70s when Studio 54 is at its height and mm -hmm. the, the personalities that were there, you know, there was talking about, I think it was his birthday party and, you know, just naming, you know, Andy Warhol, Andy Warhol, and just, I mean, it was a long list yes. of people that are there. And then as we move through and it ends, you know, with his life and, you know, so often this seems like this can happen when people, you know, there's a, there's a, a line where it describes Cone as a secret man living a public life and his mm. public persona did seem so different. Um, you know, uh, the Teflon man, he's also been referred to, but to end his life, you know, um, how he did, you know, you, you said something to me, you didn't make this film for anyone to maybe forgive Cohen, but to understand him. And um, that connected with me, especially in the very beginning of the film. Um, uh, there's a section where they say, you know, who was Ray Cohn and, you know, which, you know, there was a hundred different traits. Like there's, mm. he was just such a a man, and I'm, I'm getting it wrong now. I do apologize. No, I think I know uh, you're talking about the. It's Peter Manso, who's another journalist in the yes. film, who, um, who became friends with Cohn actually. Um, oh, sorry, my phone is going through that. Um, that and and he he says, sure, he says we we could describe Roy Cohn as evil, but that doesn't explain a hundred other things about Roy Cohn. Thank you. Something like Thank that. You. I'm probably mangling yeah. it too now. But. <laughs> no, that, that's the section though. And, and that's very telling of this film. And so um, for those of you that um, maybe are here and very interested in this era, I can guarantee you, you could have read every single book under the sun. Um, this film will uncover things from history that you um, I'm sure have never heard. The, a lot of this footage is never heard before, especially the audio tapes that, you know, were dug up, I, the, you know, from cassette tapes in the basement or, or pieces of, of garbage quite literally pulled yes. um, that 
that have never been aired before were really, really intriguing. Um, obviously, Ivy's perspective, having um, the challenge of telling this very personal story um, of her family and the role that it was. Um, so just a really very interesting documentary. And for those of you that maybe just know this story as a line or two in the history books, I can guarantee you watching this film, you will, um, this, this story of the Rosenbergs, Roy Cohn and, and the life, they will be a story that will stay with you forever. It's um, incredibly memorable, um, the way that Ivy is able to tell this and, and, and display history for us. So, um, so Ivy, I wanna say thank you so very much for, for joining us today. Thank you so much for making this film. And we hope that um, all of our professors and, and, and patrons that uh, are viewing this or will share this with each other um, so that they can view this film as well. And if they're like me, you might find yourself watching Heir to an Execution quite soon thereafter and um, becoming an Ivy Miracle <laughs> huge fan. It's great work. And as you mentioned, we'll be adding more from her history of filmmaking to our platform soon. So who knows, maybe we can have you back again, Ivy. To tell I'd us love those it. I, thank you so much, Anne, for having me. I really appreciate it. I, my, my, one of my great honors of having my work in, in universities and colleges and high schools um, is really important to me. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, all right, well, have a great rest of your day and thank you all for joining us. If there's any questions or comments, we'll make sure that we post the responses as soon as we can. Sure. All right, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Okay,